Hi, everyone. This is Lindsay Shepard, Investigative Journalism Fellow with True North, and today my guest is Mark Mancini. Mark is the National Director of the Runnymede Society. Runnymede Society is a national law student membership group dedicated to constitutionalism, individual liberty, and the rule of law. So, Mark, are, is the Runnymede Society at every law school across Canada? We're getting there. Uh, we have a few that some of the French language ones in Quebec we don't have a presence at, uh, but we just expanded to cover the University of Victoria, Lakehead University, and, and the University of Manitoba. Uh, so we're, we're at almost every law school. Awesome. So what kind of events do you do and, and what kind of work do you do um, with Meat Society? Yeah, so our kind of our bread and butter is Every semester we have an event at every chapter that we have in the country. So we'll have an event usually featuring a debate style format on legal topics, uh, especially pressing legal topics. So that's sort of the bulk of what we do. And our goal with that is to try to encourage law students to think critically about legal issues and to present issues that might not get a airing in the classroom or in the hallways of the law school. So that's sort of one part. The second part is uh, our national conference, which uh, coincidentally is taking place next month, February 28th and 29th in Toronto. And so that conference attracts law students, lawyers, and academics, uh, typically 150, 200 people. And the goal there is to, again, get some topics on the table that are pressing and that don't necessarily get an airing in the legal community as much as they should. So that so that's number two. And then number three, uh, we, we, we're expanding more into producing more legal content, more publications, articles. Uh, we have a podcast now. And again, the goal there is to have a discussion with people in the legal community about these sort of legal issues. And overriding all of this is a commitment to free speech, to open debate, and ultimately to using open debate to helping students think more critically about the law. Yeah, I mean, the, the events you guys hold at the different chapters at law schools across Canada, they're super interesting. So like a sample of some of them, uh, pipelines and the Canadian Constitution, uh, there's topics on religious freedom, uh, political correctness, proportional representation, feminist originalism. But I wanted to ask you, what what is feminist originalism? Well, yeah, we just had a podcast about that, a topic with Professor Carrie Frock, who's from the University of New Brunswick. And basically, feminist originalism is the idea that we should, inter- you know, it's a particularly Canadian uh, form of interpretation, but it's the idea that within the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, there are, as originally understood, there's a commitment to the protection of, of women's rights, so particularly in Section 28 of the Charter, uh, which guarantees equality between the sexes. Um, so th- there's this kind of nascent school of thought that I think Professor Frock has largely championed that advocates for the Constitution to be ori- interpreted as it or- originally was enacted, not how judges have said it should be, not how uh, the public thinks it should be uh, interpreted, but how it was originally intended to be interpreted. And within that interpretation, there's a, you know, there's a a good, there's good evidence that there was protections in the charter for women's rights. So that's basically the gist of feminist originalism. Okay, interesting. But yeah, I mean, there's, there's so many topics, right? And I've done two speaking events with Runnymede. So in September 2018, I did a free speech event at, uh, that was Queen's University, the law school there. And then just a couple months ago in October, I did uh, free speech and the digital charter. That was the name of the panel. And that was at University of Windsor. And honestly, you guys have such a great group of people. I was like, I, I kind of want to go to law school just so I can like hang out with these people because <laughs> they're a really great group. So how big is each campus club generally? So it ranges. Um, at some of the smaller schools where we just started, we have uh, just a handful of people that are sort of running the show. And then at other schools, we have, you know, 10 uh, people that are sort of in the club, 15 people that are in the club. And then, of course, we have membership that are sort of associated with that, people who attend the events, who attend the conference, uh, but who aren't in an organization role. So it really does vary. 
And then, so in September 2019, um, there was an article in the Globe and Mail. And uh, so they called you, the, well, the title of the article was Libertarian Student Group Runnymede Society Seeks to Shake Up Canada's Legal Culture. Do you feel mm. like calling you a libertarian group is an accurate depiction? Not at all. No. Uh, so that was, I mean, the article was an interesting sort of look into what we do, but unfortunately the characterization of us as libertarian is completely off the mark. Uh, we are officially a nonpartisan, apolitical organization. We don't have a, uh, a view on, on politics, uh, so we aren't really, we can't be characterized as libertarian. Just as evidence of that, you know, we, we, we have speakers from all over the political political spectrum who come out to our events. We're going to have Elizabeth May speaking about the carbon tax, uh, for example, at our conference in uh, February. So we, we really can't be accused of being <laughs> of being particularly aligned to one side of the aisle. Now, if it's the case that, you know, a belief in free speech is a libertarian value, then that might be different. But I think free speech and commitment to open debate is a value that should permeate every ass, every part of the political spectrum. It shouldn't be something that's reserved to a libertarian, for example. So overall, though, I think the characterization was really inaccurate. Yeah, I did see that Elizabeth May was uh, speaking at the Law and Freedom Conference. I thought that was super interesting because she is like a trained lawyer, isn't she, before she went into politics? Yeah, she is, and uh, she was, and uh, obviously she just brings a ton of experience and knowledge about environmental issues that I think will be really a great addition to the panel and to, to just the discussion of the carbon tax. And so you did your um, your JD at the University of New Brunswick at the Faculty of Law there, and then mm -hmm. you actually did your Master of Laws at the University of Chicago, and the University of Chicago is kind of the, they're very known for their free speech. Um, they they have the University of Chicago, what is it called? The Statement of Principles for Free Speech? Yeah, something um, like that, yeah. Yeah, and so they were kind of championing the idea that, well, we're not really into this idea of safe spaces and we do want to have a place of open inquiry here on campus. So what was your experience doing your Master of Laws there? Yeah, so, you know, before I went into the school, uh, I, you know, I had heard about the commitment to free speech and the principles, and, uh, you know, it, it was something that appealed to me, but I didn't really know whether or not it would actually be represented in the classrooms and in the, in the hallways and, you know, in the, in the actual ethos of the school. But uh, I was pleasantly surprised to find out that it's actually a big part of what the school does. I mean, the classroom is a the cl the classroom there is a place for truly open debate and discussion. I mean, everybody they they operate there on the Socratic method. So, you know, you're cold calling class for answers. You have to come prepared to be an informed participant in the discussion. People are encouraged to speak their minds. And this sort of every class I had was really like this. And it was really a commitment to critical thinking and open inquiry, which really, really appealed to me. And I, I you know, I, in those environments, I tend to flourish and uh, learn a lot. And so I really enjoyed my time there because of that, because of that operationalized commitment to free speech. It wasn't just an ideal. I think it's something that permeates the school itself. And when you were there, like, so you could actually feel that commitment like that was your lived experience right yeah for sure <laughs> for, for sure it was it was something that I that you really you feel in that um you know you benefit from so that it was really a great experience there was that contrasted with University of New Brunswick in any way well New Brunswick I mean I think Canadian law schools are generally pretty open to um free speech, although not not to the extent that Chicago is. Like, I think uh, there's just not the same culture of sort of, you know, unbridled free speech at Canadian law schools. But I think it's still a value that that I think is present in Canadian law schools. At New Brunswick, I, I never really felt that I couldn't speak my mind. I um, The school is great and the professors were great, but there, there just isn't the same sort of hard and fast commitment that you would see at a school like Chicago. Right. And so um, 
are Runnymede Society chapters um, across Canada, are any of them, like, controversial? Or do they ever get, like, a negative reaction from other professors or faculty on campus? Or is it generally, like, Runnymede is received pretty well? Uh, that is dependent on the school. Uh, we Generally, I would say we've been received very well, and I think that's just evident in the success that we've seen um, since we started just a few years ago. So generally, I would say we received well. I don't want to they want to label schools or name schools per se, but uh, some schools, you know, we have we have uh, we have opposition. Uh, we have opposition from students. We have opposition from professors. Um, but to my mind, that just means that we're doing something right. That we're presenting, you know, we're presenting presenting these events in good faith. We're trying to be real contributors to the Canadian legal culture. And that's going to upset some people sometimes. And while we want everyone to benefit from our events and we invite everyone, no matter who they are, to come to our events and to participate, some people will be turned off. And that's just that's sort of the, the price of admission. We, we sort of expect that to a certain degree. And so for your annual conference, the, the Law and Freedom Conference, you mentioned like academics, law students, lawyers go. Is it also open to the general public? And yeah, it's open to the general public. I just listed those three because those are generally the three top yeah. top groups that we get. But yes, it's open to the general public. And in the past, we've had non-lawyers and uh, people in other disciplines come to, come to the event, people in economics, for example, uh, lots of other you know professors and academics from other disciplines. So it, it is open to the general public. Nice. Okay. And then my uh, last question for you was, what is the you know hottest topic in constitutional law right now? Yeah, uh, tough question, but I, I think it's got to be just the uh, the topic of the environment, and within that, I'll include you know the pipelines and the uh, the carbon tax. Uh, I think right now, so the sort of the area of law that that engages is uh, is federalism. You know, our division of powers typically not a uh, sexy or exciting topic for most people, but it turns out that it's very important because that's what guides what's going to happen with whether or not we can build pipelines in this country, uh, whether or not the carbon tax is a constitutional mechanism of dealing with the climate, you know, climate change. These are all things that are going to come down to the division of power. So it's getting, you know, people are getting very interested in this topic because of those issues. So I would say those collectively, those are sort of the hottest topics right now. Okay, that's interesting. I wasn't expecting that answer. I was expecting more like religious freedom, maybe like um, Bill Twenty One. Is it in? Uh, yeah, profession? I mean that's that's certainly a. I would you know that to me. I mean uh, this is subjective uh, inherently, but to me that's like a close second. I think Bill Twenty One is something that is also stressing our constitutional traditions, and it's uh, an area where the feminist originalism that we talked about is going to come in come into play. I think because. The section I mentioned, section 28, is sort of the basis of one of the challenges to the bill. So it's you know it's that's that's a really important topic too. Uh, but it you know I think the reason I chose sort of the pipelines and the carbon tax are the national implications of it. The you know the pipelines are something that we've been you know as a country um, we've been trying to grapple with for many years now, and the carbon tax has been incredibly controversial. So I mean that's why those sort of make the top of the list for me. And then aside from um, the division of power and, and the issues with, you know, provinces and, and federal government, um, do like First Nations rights come into there too? Oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, so, the, you know, there are some First Nations depending on the, <clears throat> excuse me, depending on the project that are supportive of, of uh, the building of pipelines, but others are not. And so there have been many, uh, challenges to the, you know the propriety of approving pipe, uh, approving pipelines that First Nations have launched, and you know their rights are are in within the Constitution, so they they form a constitutional basis, and they uh, they have good claims in many cases to challenge the uh, the way that these pipelines were approved or or the way that they're being built. So that plays into it too, and it just it really it it makes it so that this issue is so fraught with difficult constitutional issues, all of which, though, need to be considered and weighed properly. Yeah, I mean, something interesting that happened recently, I don't know if you saw this, but um, so mm -hmm. the UN 
said that we need to just not build these pipelines because it's an infringement on indigenous rights and indigenous lands. Right. And the the BC Human Rights Commissioner, uh, Kasari Govender, said, yes, I agree with the UN. But then a whole bunch of people in Canada were like, well, hey, actually, the, the you know 20 or so First Nations along the pipeline route, they actually want it. Um, and then the UN was like, oh, sorry, we didn't realize they wanted it. <laughs> Did you hear that? I did hear about that, and yeah. uh, I mean, it's sort of just my personal view. It's a bit embarrassing for the UN to say the least. Um, you know, just didn't they? Yeah, didn't they say they they don't do research on those matters or something? They, but yet they yeah. still released a statement. <laughs> they did say that, yes, and I I think you know it's it just obviously they were not attuned to what's actually going on in Canada. Uh, it's a lot. I think just I, I'm not an expert on it, but just from looking at the situation. It's a lot more complicated than how they framed it. There's a lot, you know, there's a lot, there are groups that are opposed to it. There are groups that are supportive of it. And that makes it complicated, but that's part of living in Canada, I think. Absolutely. Well, that makes uh, all these issues very, very timely, as you said, um, the hottest topics in constitutional law. Well, thanks so much for talking with me today, Mark. Can we check out your Twitter anywhere or any other social media for Runny Mead Society? Yeah, so we have um, my, my Twitter handle is uh, at Mark P. Mancini. And then, of course, we just have the general Runnymede Society Twitter handle, which is just Runnymede SOC. And uh, the, running, really, the Runnymede account is where you'll see all of our uh, information about our events, our conference, all of our upcoming discussions. And, uh, and you know, you can stay tuned to things there. All right, perfect. And we at True North, we're at tnc.news. And I'm Lindsay Shepard. Thanks again, Mark, and have a great day. Yes, thank you for having me.